first growth to this area, Kansas City, like many growing cities in the West, turned to large-scale expositions as a way to promote local business and to draw potential investors and even tourists to the city. The earliest such expositions took place around 1870 on fairgrounds located near 12th and McGee. The show's popularity dictated that more substantial facilities should replace the tents. Kansas City built a major exposition hall in 1887. It's popularly called Crystal Palace because it, it was patterned roughly after the Crystal Palace in London and essentially had a, a glass roof. It was a big deal. We brought the president in. Scrooge Cleveland came into town. And the exposition hall had art by local and regional artists that were on exhibit. And they were juried and they were judged and awards were handed out. Through buildings like the Crystal Palace, Kansas City was trying to prove itself a modern 19th century city, but it still had a considerable Wild West reputation to overcome. In fact, in 1873, Jesse James and his brother Frank had robbed the exposition of $978.
surviving conceptual paintings, called cartoons, show Fidelli's attention to detail and mastery of color. Fidelli's gift with color in his murals was not without its own irony. One of the family's stories is that he was colorblind and that his wife would prepare his palette for him and he would visualize and draw the cartoons that were then used as the preparations or instructions for his assistants that included some of his children. There were other muralists around, I'm sure, but he's the one that we know best from the fact that the works have survived. Fidelli's work, which adorned churches, private homes, and government buildings, was not without some controversy. His paintings of formerly clad Greek women on the Kansas State House were mistakenly seen by some as nudes and later painted over. From the 1860s on, um, there were very few formal galleries as we think today. There were the beginnings of dealers, but generally those individuals would just gather groups of paintings, show them in a showroom type space, and then in the 1870s, you have the beginning of a couple of art shops here in town. You have the first the sort of precursors of what we think of as art dealers. In the early days, uh, uh, someone selling and buying art could not make a living. And so they sold artist supplies as well, frames, kind of became a jack of all trades for anything artistic. William Boker, an uh, important character in Kansas City's history, came here in 1880, and his business was picture frames. And he would sell you pictures to go in with the picture frames. W.W. W. Finley and Thorne, who were two of the main suppliers, also specialized in picture frames and popular art. In the latter half of the 1800s, the most notable of Kansas City area painters was almost certainly George Caleb Bingham. Born in 1811, his family settled in the Arrow Rock area. After training in the East, he returned to Kansas City to pursue his career. He made his living really on portraiture. The portraits, of course, were commissioned, which meant that an individual asked Mr. Bingham to paint their portrait and he would receive a sum of money for them. So there was, of course, the desire that you portray the person with, uh, from their best side, so to speak. Um, but also you learn a lot about them. The portrait of Dr. Truth is a wonderful example because there you see the doctor with books dressed in a well-cut dark coat, really as a man of substance. You get that sense from him not only physically, but also from the surroundings. Bingham's portraits tell us a lot about the people who lived in Kansas City, and it really is an encyclopedia of the figures who made Kansas City what it has now become. While Bingham's portraits of the city's movers and shakers in the late 1800s allowed Bingham to survive, it was his genre pictures, these scenes of everyday life, that put him front and center in the issues of American painting at mid-century. Bingham specialized in painting scenes of things that he saw in his daily experience. Those are in which his personal reputation was made, and also Missouri's art reputation. The incident of the famous Order 11, when General Ewing ordered the forcible removal of Kansas City residents in 1863, enraged tremendous numbers of Missourians, and particularly George Caleb Bingham. It is an image that is just heart-wrenching. You see people fleeing, you see fires burning, and the staunch Union officers who are causing this removal seemingly unswayed. The actual place where the incident that's depicted occurred 
is supposedly downtown at Fourth and Delaware. It is a scene that is just so closely tied to our Kansas City heritage. Bingham never thought of himself as a historical figure. He was an artist trying to make his way just like any other artist today. And by looking at him and understanding his creation, I think it helps us understand ourselves. The mid-19th century saw a great many technological breakthroughs, improvements in forms of mass reproduction, brought new opportunities in publishing, so that even fledgling towns like Kansas City could boast their own newspaper and publishing houses. The earliest published illustration of Kansas City in a book appeared in an 1858 edition chronicling the history of the area. It's the annals of Kansas City. It's considered to be the first history of Kansas City. It was done by C.C. Spaulding. It's a track that tells people why Kansas City is a good place to come and live. It's less history than it is Roosterism. This early illustration was duplicated through a form of engraving known as woodcutting. However, woodcuts were soon superseded by a new development in duplication of art for mass distribution. Lithography was a practical and effective method of producing multiple images easily and quickly. 